Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. And this is one of those programs that I look forward to on The Journey Home every once in a while. Uh, of course, I love all the guests. I don't want to uh, delineate one from the other, but uh, I enjoy when I have a returning guest, especially a, a guest that uh, is well liked by all the EWTN audiences in the past. And uh, it, it's just exciting to have Dr. David Anders back on the program. It's been a long time. I think I was with you for the first time in 2010. Yeah, and I think the last time, uh, Dave, that you were on the journey home was the actually the last time that we did the journey home in the studio at EWTN. Uh, David's a former Presbyterian, and he's well known to EWTN television and radio because he's the host of EWTN's Call to Communion. We'll talk about that. Uh, in a bit. He's also the author of a new book, uh, The Catholic Church Saved My Marriage. And so uh, uh, I know that you've already done a bookmark with, mm -hmm. with Doug Keck on that, so we won't reduplicate that and encourage the audience to go to that and watch it. But also you have a website, Calvin2, the, the numeral Number 2, two yeah. Calvin2Catholic.com. But David, welcome back to Thank the Thank you so much. Home. It's my pleasure to be here. I mean, I... Should have had you back long since. That's way too long. But it's good to have you here. It really is. And it, I'm also excited. I've had the privilege of joining you on your program. I think one time I filled in for you. Yes, a, you did. A, a you way did. back, and I've had you on Deep in Scripture. So I've got a number. I was, of, I was in Houston on that day, and I turned on the radio and I listened to you and Doug Keck take the place <laughs> of me and Tom Price. That was kind of fun. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, but welcome back to the journey home. What we Thank usually you. do on a return appearances. Uh, I know that the, your previous Journey Home appearance with a, a longer detailed description of your journey is available online, mm -hmm. so I encourage mm -hmm. the audience to do that. But for those that haven't seen the program, I'd like to invite you to begin by giving us a summary of your journey. Sure. Your so briefly, I grew up in an evangelical family, meaning very kind of born-again, Billy Graham-type spirituality, pray to receive Christ, trust in Jesus for your salvation. I grew up in a in a city, Birmingham, Alabama, where there are very few Catholics, and all the Catholics that I knew were ex-Catholics, <laughs> and uh, they went to our church, and I would ask them, did you grow up a Christian? And they would say, oh, no, I grew up a Catholic, you know, and quite seriously, they were, you know, they meant that, what they said, and and, uh, and often they would tell the same story. I, I didn't know Christ when I was a Catholic. I didn't know my own tradition. I didn't know the Bible, and I didn't develop a living Christian faith till I left the church. So, that combined with all the prejudices built into my Presbyterian heritage, I had no reason to take Catholicism seriously or Catholics as anything other than mm. objects of conversion or proselytism. And that's how I viewed them. I viewed them as kind of these benighted fools, honestly, that were yeah. in slavish obedience to a Roman tyrant and trying to earn their salvation by crawling up a string of rosary beads to heaven and, and uh, flagellating themselves on the way to the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe. I thought it was just a superstitious, backward, medieval uh, kind of a slavish existence. And I had no interest in the Catholic faith. And But um, when I developed a deeper, well, I say deeper, more engaged interior life in college, decided to take my own Presbyterian faith more seriously. Also met a young lady that I ended up marrying. Uh, it was a natural transition to go to seminary eventually. Uh, went to a Chris Christian college, Wheaton College, studied theology there, went to seminary. Really orienting myself towards an academic career. Thought I'd be a professor in an evangelical college or seminary, teach church history. So went on and got a PhD in church history. And it didn't turn out the way I thought. <laughs> so like so many people, studying the history of the church ultimately led me into the Catholic Church. After doing a doctoral dissertation on John Calvin, I tell people John Calvin made me a Catholic. And uh, there were all these well, you know, sort of fundamental theses of evangelical religion, and they began to fall one after another. Of course, the, the big one for me was justification by faith alone. Yeah. That was the doctrine on which the church stands or falls, as I understood it. And what began to open my eyes was reading Augustine, great 4th century doctor of the church, 5th century doctor of the church, whom the Protestants had claimed as their own. And as I began to read him, voluminously I realized that Augustine, by golly, he was a Catholic. His understanding of salvation was deeply Catholic. Sacramental, moral, interior renovation, none of this Lutheran idea of imputed righteousness or faith alone. But I also began to find, once I was married and began to have children, 
not only was the doctrine of justification false to history, I eventually discovered it was also false to Scripture, too. It wasn't what St. Paul meant by saved by faith and not works of the law. Yeah. But it was also false to my own experience because I found that I needed more than faith alone. I desperately needed the renovation of my interior life and my moral life in grace because the conviction that faith alone would save was making me into a bad human being. Hmm. And the attitude I had had as a child that I needed to convert or proselytize people who didn't have the true faith Hmm. meant that my orientation towards people was manipulative and exploitive. I was interested in you because you were a mark, someone that I could convert to my understanding of evangelical Christianity. And that was actually part of my spirituality. You know, I wasn't looking for, am I charitable or kind or patient or humble? After all, Christians are totally depraved, right? That's what the Reformed Presbyterian (laughs) tradition taught. But do you have the true faith? So it made me a very annoying dinner guest, but it made me a bad husband and a bad father. I remember, um, and I was to a certain extent in that camp myself, the John 15, vine in the branches, abide in Christ, produce fruit. And if you don't produce fruit, you're not abiding. My interpret is the producing of fruit is the conversion of those people. Okay. Just like you're talking about. Okay. That target, that person. What's the production of fruit? Conversion of those people. Well, you know, there was a debate in the Protestant tradition in the 17th century about how do you know you're saved? And it's a big issue for them you know, to yeah. know for sure you're saved. And there were those that said, well, you, you can know from these evidences, from these moral behaviors that flow from your conversion. Puritan. And then there were others that yeah. said, well, even within Puritanism, they had this debate. There were yeah, others right. that said, well, yeah, but if you, if you parse that behavior fine enough, you're going to find the roots of pride and concupiscence and sin. So it's got to be just this kind of purely subjective, illuminative experience. And those two camps went to war. And... And there's really no way out of that box. You know, you either are, you have the presumption of I'm saved in spite of my bad behavior or you despair, you know, because you realize my behavior is so bad I can't be saved. And the Catholic answer ultimately was so much more sensible. And I discovered it in the confessional that that, that first priest that said to me, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I recognized Jesus said that if I stick with the sacraments, He who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, abides in me. I have an objective promise that Mm. grace is on offer. And he told me again, he who perseveres to the end will be saved. I I may not know for sure whether I'm in the state of grace, but I know for sure where grace is to be found. Mm. And if I lay hold of that and stick with that until the end, I will be saved. I will be saved. So better than absolute certainty, it gave me the theological virtue of hope. And that was a much sounder basis for living out my Christian life. So, you know, justification fell apart. Sola Scriptura fell apart. Uh, my whole doctrine of the church fell apart. Denominationalism went up in flames. Uh, I, was, um, I was a Calvin scholar. Hmm. And reading Calvin, I actually realized they would kick Calvin out of my Presbyterian church. <laughs> because his ecclesiology, his yeah. view of the sacraments, was so much more robust You know, the modern denominational idea is that it doesn't really matter what denomination you belong to. As long as you have a sincere faith, you can belong to any church you want to. That that idea is not represented in the Bible at all. And it's not even in early Protestantism anywhere. It emerged kind of by default because Protestants couldn't agree on anything. (laughs) And so they had to concoct this view, well, obviously we don't have to agree. Well, it's not obvious to me at all. You know, and so denominationalism fell apart. And I recognize, there, no, there is a coherent, definitive practice of the Christian faith. It's normative. There's room for variety. But there is something that means to be a Christian that we all have to agree on, the difference between dogma and opinion. And uh, so after, you know, Sola Scriptura, denomination, doctrine of the church, justification by faith, um, the moral life, the life of prayer, um, I, was, I got to the end of my wits. And I said, I'm either going to have to become a Catholic or I'm going to have to give up the Christian faith. Hmm. I'm going to push you on a few things, my friend. Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, not push you in the, in the... But I want you to go back a bit. You said you, were, you went to Wheaton, you were an evangelical, a Billy Graham-type Calvinist. 
One of the things that opened my heart to the church was recognizing this one book, this Bible, the sole foundation of my faith, but we never agreed on it, all the different groups. But you've just described Wheaton, Evangelical, Billy Graham type, who, who I had great respect for, Calvinist, even just in that statement, we have uh, uh, contradictions of oh, sure. theology. Sure, sure. I mean, for example, <clears throat> free will, the whole justification thing. How did you understand free will back then? Well, did we have free will? You know, Luther wrote a book in 1525. I know you know the text called On the Bondage of the Will. And it's interesting. In that book, he says that the Reformation is really not about the Pope or the, pap the papacy, purgatory, or even indulgences. He says those things are mere trifles and not worthy of debate. For Luther, the key issue was, can we freely cooperate with God's grace? And Luther said no. And the Catholic Church said yes. No. And so I was a partisan a sectarian Protestant, very keen to imitate the thinking of my founder. So I was very much committed to determinism and the denial of the doctrine of human freedom for a long time. Yeah. For a long time. You know, I've done it for many years, a little program called Verses I Never Saw. Yes. This morning, I had encountered a verse I never saw. And I was thinking as you were talking, given your background, what you did with this verse, book, a verse in Philemon, where Paul is trying to get Philemon to accept Onesimus, the slave, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Back as a Christian brother. But he's not forcing him. Mm -hmm. He's not telling him what he has to do. But he says this, But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own free will. And I could remember what I did with that verse back when I was just like you. I brought up Lutheran, Presbyterian that believe that our will, we really don't have a free will. But there's Paul saying, you do have the complete freedom. It's totally up to you to decide what you're going to do with your slave. So what would I have done with that? I would have read, read that text as an Edwardsian through the lens that Jonathan Edwards gives in his book on the doctrine of the will, which is to say that Edwards, who was a Calvinist, of course, would admit that humans had freedom insofar as there was an inner principle that would determine the outcome of their actions. But men really do choose what they want. And in that sense, he would acknowledge that they are free. They're free to do what they want. But they're not to define what, they're not free to determine what they want, yeah. because what they want is determined by a whole host of of, uh, of uh, preceding factors, antecedent factors, that all fall within the scope of God's providence. So he simply, he, he, he qualifies, he, d he acknowledges freedom, but then qualifies it away. Yeah. Yeah. And, and St. Thomas has a very, St. Thomas Aquinas, of course, common doctor of the Catholic faith, has a very strong doctrine of God's providence. Too strong for some. Not everybody in the Catholic Church is a Thomist. And really does teach that even free human actions fall within the scope of God's determining activity. But he also acknowledges that there is a real sense in which humans are the cause of their actions, a secondary cause, in the same way that God is not making this cup stick to this table. Gravity is. But God's cooperating with the gravity. God's creating the conditions that allow gravity to work. But it's not meaningless to talk about gravity having a genuine instrumental role to play in sticking this cup to the table. And in the same way, humans, Thomas would teach, are genuine secondary causes of their own activity, and it's meaningful to say so. Our guest is Dr. David Anders, and he's the host of EWTN's Called to Communion. The reason I pose that with you, uh, excellent, David, is to point out that even in that simple little verse, it can't be Scripture alone. Oh, sure, sure. It can't be Scripture alone. You needed a tradition on top of that to be able to put your theology and your philosophy and the words of Scripture into some kind of uh, order to be able to live it out. Well, the first time I was on with you in 2010, 
the scripture alone fell apart for me when I posed the question to myself, why do I believe the doctrine? Why do I believe in Sola Scriptura? And I recognized instantly that I believed it because my tradition had transmitted it to me. It was on the authority of tradition that I believed in Scripture alone. That seemed absurd to me. But then when I began to break it down further, I realized that the doctrine was incoherent at several levels. One of them, of course, is that Christ himself never indicates to us that we are to discern the Christian faith from an examination of the Bible. On the contrary, yeah. Jesus gives provisions for handing on the faith, and his provisions were oral tradition and the teaching authority of the magisterium. Go therefore into all nations, make disciples, teach them everything I have commanded you, all of which was oral. I'll be with you to the end of the age. Do this in memory of me. Whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. As the Father sends me, I, so I send you. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. St. Paul receives that by way of tradition. The tradition I receive from the Lord I hand on to you. And as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So it was oral tradition, the sacred liturgy, teaching office of the church until he comes again. Yeah. No mention of the Bible alone. So that was one problem. And then logically, it, it just fell apart because you can't discern. There's no principled way as a Protestant to tell the difference between dogma and opinion. Even if we look at the Bible and disagree, how do we know if that disagreement is substantive or not? No way to know. And so the doctrine was, uh, was just reduced to philosophical absurdity in an instant. And I lost the, you know, I lost the faith, really, yeah, over that. Yeah. I, I remember a journey that I went through, and I wondered if you went through the same. When I was in seminary, evangelical seminary, very high view of Scripture. Um, and I remember us talking about, well, there was oral tradition in there behind the Gospels, mm -hmm. behind mm -hmm. that. I remember struggling with that. I, you know, Q or something else that was there before that was carrying on the ideas, or that actually the, the stories we have in the Gospels were written down years later as a result of years of oral tradition. And I remember when it struck me, and I struggled with that issue because of my view of Scripture, but also I remember when I realized that actually every New Testament letter written by Paul or James or John or Peter always assumed that their audience already had it. Mm -hmm, exactly. Talk about that in your own journey. Sure, sure. So they had, they had the kerygma, they had the sacraments, they had the elements of the faith. Tradition precedes the scriptures. Now, here's something that I often ask people. If God gave us a divinely inspired cookbook, could tell you how to make the, a heavenly meringue. <laughs> you would never presume that the cookbook could also give you instructions on how to order your church because that's manifestly not its purpose. <laughs> and in the same way, people try to squeeze out of the Bible answers to questions that the Bible is not intended to answer. It's not <laughs> supposed to be a manual on church government or even a dogmatic theology text. A simple investigation of the various components of the Bible tell us what it is. Paul's letter to the Corinthians is a very occasional document dealing with a particular set of problems in one historic church in one time. Uh, you know, the Gospels are snapshots of key moments in the life of Christ. And you could, so on, you can go and analyze each of the texts. None of them is a comprehensive manual on Christian life. Why does the Bible exist? Why did God give us the Bible? Through the church. He gave it to us to inform our life of prayer and moral reflection and to edify, but not to be the be-all and end-all to define everything about our Christian life. That's, that was never its function or purpose. Yeah, I mean, even just the letter I, I read from sure. Philemon. Sure. It was a personal letter from Paul to his buddy, you know, and they got a slave between them, you know, and how do you... It was a personal letter. And we haven't even talked about the canon problem. <laughs> how, do you know, how do you know you have the right list? How do you know the Protestants have 66 books? We have 73. How do you know it's 66? Why, why not 67? How about 40? And if, even if you go with 73, why not 75? You know, yeah. you, you must advert to tradition. You must, even if you believe in illumination, even if God speaks to you and says, these books are divine, well, maybe there's another one I still need. How do you know? Without adverting to tradition, you can't know with certainty that you even have the right list of books. Let's talk about Our Lady, because uh, she's often one of the biggest hurdles for so many on the journey. Uh, where was Our Lady uh, before 
when you were, long before you were thought about becoming a Catholic church, was she a difficult barrier for you into the church? And, and where is she now? Catholic devotion to saints, not just to Our Lady, but to the saints and to their relics, was to me the most manifest absurdity. It was the most rank superstition that could serve no purpose. And I was certain <laughs> that Catholics had brought this into the practice of the Christian faith from their pagan origins. And that's that critique is articulated by Calvin, the man that I studied, he wrote a diatribe against relics that was a, just a parody and a satire of all the most superstitious kind of medieval practices that he could possibly lampoon. <laughs> and uh, so that was my mindset. But in my dissertation work, I was really studying Calvin's critique of late medieval Catholicism, and it forced me to dig deeper into the history of these Catholic devotions and spiritual practices. And as I read more deeply, especially in the ancient church, one of the things that struck me was that you could not find a layer of Christian practice in which there was no devotion to the saints. It didn't matter if you were looking at popular spirituality or the most elite and refined theologians. It didn't matter if you looked in the East or the West, the North or the South, Latin, Greek, Syriac, Coptic, wherever you went throughout the world, you found this practice. There's a passage in St. Jerome's uh, letter against Vigilantius when he says, Jerome, of course, is fourth century doctor of the church. He says, does the bishop of Rome do wrong? Does he do wrong? When he offers the holy sacrifice, he's talking about the mass, over the bones of the martyrs Peter and Paul, and not the bishop of Rome only, but all the bishops throughout the world. It's what we call Catholicity, the universality of the practice. And I realized studying that if I wish to claim any continuity with the ancient church, I may not reject devotion to the saints and their relics. And that forced me, okay, so this is, this is the practice. How then can I make sense of it? Is there a theology that makes sense of this? And of course there is. The doctrine of the communion of saints, that we really are Christ in a mystical sense. We are his body. St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 that we have become God's co-laborers as if Christ was making his appeal through us. We become members of Christ's body, the church. He who beholds the church beholds Christ. That's what St. Gregory of Nyssa says. And it and we see manifest in Scripture that Jesus chooses to manifest his grace to the world through these broken material instruments. St. Paul, St. Peter, touching handkerchiefs, bringing people back to life, healing the sick, you know. Back in 2 Kings chapter 13, the, the relics of the prophet Elisha, bring a dead man back to life. And, and I, I began to see, yes, if I regard these not as pagan gods, as, as objects to be worshipped, but as instruments of grace, participating in that work of redemption as members of Christ's body, the church, all of a sudden, my, my, my moral imagination, my universe of friendship has opened up. It's not merely the church on earth which with, with which I'm in fellowship. It's the church triumphant in heaven. That great cloud of witnesses that Hebrews talks about, or Revelation 5, those 24 elders offering up the prayers of the church on earth before the throne of God is so much incense. And suddenly it became a beautiful picture of a deeper communion with Jesus. And I said, it's biblical. It's historical. It's also rational, and it's edifying. I, I can accept that. And once I was able to wrap my head around the communion of saints, putting Our Lady into that picture, I already had a conceptual framework in which she made sense. And her imminent sanctity as the one full of grace, the Theotokos, the mother of God, made her elevation above that hmm. company of saints quite reasonable to me. You mentioned in Jerome's quote, the, the Pope and all the bishops of the world offering this sacrifice, right? Mm -hmm. The use of that word oh, itself, yeah. which would have been a problem. Arrestus Brownson, a, a convert from I 150 know. years ago, you know I'm I know sure. what you're going to say. I he know talked about say. saint worship. Yes. And he said, the re talk about that, because that's he, what he does. He identifies why our separated brethren think we worship saints. You know, Marcus, you are the only other person I've ever met who has <laughs> gone to Brownson on this question. I've read Brownson. I'm thrilled to meet someone else who's read Brownson on this. Brownson makes a brilliant observation. He says the reason that Protestants reject devotion to saints 
um, is because they have rejected the notion of sacrifice, and so they don't know the difference between worship and veneration. Worship, worship, the honor due to Almighty God, is sacrifice. St. Paul says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is your spiritual act of worship, all right? The centerpiece of Catholic worship is the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the offering of the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus to God the Father in reparation for the sins of the world. All right, that's worship. To salute the flag is just veneration. But Protestants threw out the idea of sacrificial worship. They threw out the sacrifice of the Mass. And so for them, there is no distinction between an act of worship and an act of veneration. It was left and as so, prayer. Yeah, and so they uh, prayer exactly, and so they get they get confused. You, if you look at the canon of the mass, this is the the prayer in which the priest consecrates the body and blood of Christ in the in the in the Eucharist. The saints come alongside us as partners in this sublime act of worship, offering this one sacrifice. The whole church, heaven and on earth, offering Jesus to God the Father. The saints don't appear in the mass as as the recipients of veneration or worship, but as participants yeah. in that. And it's there more than any place else that that thing becomes focused. Do you know, do you know who the Coloridians were? You know about the Coloridians? Mm-hmm. Okay, Epiphanius of Salamis, 5th <laughs> century doctor of the church, identifies this Arabian heresy called Coloridianism, in which a, a small group of women attempted to worship the Blessed Virgin Mary as a goddess and offer her sacrifice. And he smacked that down pretty quick, and it died out. It was a heretical movement. But most people have not heard of Coloridianism. The reason why is the one time in history when someone actually tried to worship the saints, it vanished without a trace. There's just one document from ancient history that testifies to it. Catholics have never Everyone at the time, from the top to the bottom, knew in their gut this was wrong. Of course. Yeah. Of course they knew it was wrong. So they knew it was wrong. Well, let's take a break. The other thing I want to talk about before we... Uh, when we come back, is uh, the physicality Mm. of the faith and how Mm -hmm. different that is from where we came from as Lutheran or Calvinists uh, who rejected the physicality Mm -hmm. of of Mm -hmm. worship and the faith Mm -hmm. and how actually uh, not only central but essential it is. I'd like to get that when we come back. And before we take a break, I do want to just say something to you. If you like... uh, Dr. Anders' story, if it's encouragement to you, if hearing the conversion stories of men and women who've been drawn by the Holy Spirit to the church is an encouragement to you, something more you want to find out about, then I encourage you to come to our website, chnetwork.org, where we've got a gazillion conversion stories online for you to read or listen to. And uh, and if you're on the journey, we're there to help you. So please contact us at chnetwork.org. All right, see you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Mark Scrodi, your host, and Dr. David Anders is our guest. CalvinToCatholic.com is his website, and he's also the host, uh, the host of uh, Called to Communion on EWTN, and as well as the author of The Catholic Church Saved My Marriage. And uh, he has an interview with Doug Keck on the uh, Bookmark program on that book. We might get to it a little bit. Before the break, I mentioned that I wanted to talk about the importance of the physicality mm-hmm. of the Catholic faith and, and how that's different from where you came from. Sure, you sure. So the tradition I grew up in, I would really describe it as Gnostic. If you know about the ancient 2nd century heresy of Gnosticism, the Gnostics were people who believed that you could attain salvation through an act of intellection. Like what's in your head, what you know mm-hmm. about reality somehow clicks something in the divine economy so that when you die, you're zapped out of this evil material world to a better place. That was very similar to the tradition I was raised in. And and it, it's most sort of gross expression. It could be reduced to the idea that re- repeating a mantra, reciting a formula, 
the sinner's prayer, Jesus come into my heart, that phrase somehow locks you into the divine economy and you're guaranteed salvation. Now the problem with that view, so many problems with that view, but one of them is it really reduces our material life to absurdity. Of what value then this material life, this life of, of marriage and family and children and society, if it's essentially disconnected from eternity, it is, it's of, of no ultimate value, except as a realm in which to encounter this Gnostic information. And so what do you do with it? What do you do with the 80 years you have on earth? If you pray to receive Christ when you're seven, and nothing you can do can dislodge that, and that was the teaching, right? You're, right. you're guaranteed salvation. What do you do with the next, you know, 73 years of your life? And, and uh, it's, it's easy to fall into a kind of amoralism to be antinomian, antinomian, somebody who, hey, the law, morality, is really well, of no consequence. What I was going to say life. is connected with something I had said earlier, and that is if you're in that mindset, once you've accepted Jesus at a Bible camp, then what, well, now what? Well, Christianity becomes like a pyramid scheme. In other words, the only thing left is for me to get somebody else to make that exactly. same thing. And to get to that person, and then that person gets someone else to say it, and then there's, that's all there is. Sure, it's, sure. it's a very thin theology. It's that's very it. thin theology. And it's a very banal way to live one's life. Yeah. Because life is, life is a rich and textured, many-faceted thing with enormous beauty and, and, and pathos and horror and pain. And it's, it's an amazing panoply of, of experiences. Of what meaning and value are these? If the only thing that I can do of eternal value is to convert another soul or myself be converted. So this is why I mentioned earlier that the doctrine of faith alone, it fell apart for me not only theologically, academically, but in my interior life, I began to see I needed more things than just faith alone. I needed the renovation of my interior life in charity. I needed the virtues. I, wasn't, I didn't learn about the virtues growing up. Now, the virtues are very embodied. You talk about the importance of the body. Mm -hmm. The virtues are very embodied. They're, they're, they're habits that we acquire to live in the world in justice or in patience or in temperance. How Do I eat too much? You know, Do I watch too much TV? I mean, these are very embodied practices. And then how, of course, I relate to my wife uh, it, it, intimately or just socially or uh, to my neighbor. And the Catholic faith has an answer to all of those things. Now, the answer is a grace that actually changes my embodied experience of the world. And it's a grace that comes to me through embodied and material media, especially through the yeah. sacraments. Yeah. And the sacraments, we must remember, they're more than signs and symbols, but they are signs and symbols. They're signs and symbols that come with a promise of efficacy. Jesus says, if you, if you engage in this ritual, this sign, this symbol, I will give you the grace that is being figured or symbolized therein. And there's a thing about performing a ritual or a symbol over and over and over again. It's habit forming. <laughs> and if you do it with intention, what is being figured here? Well, when I go to the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, I see symbolized in front of me Christ's self-sacrifice for his church. That's what's being symbolized by the separate consecration. Bread here, wine there, body, blood, pulled apart, death. But the Holy Spirit comes along and actually activates that and, and recapitulates that sacrifice in my own heart so that I too, hopefully, if I cooperate with grace, become a man who is willing to sacrifice like Christ did for his church, lay down my life for my wife, for my family, for my kids, for my society. And you go week after week after week and you build this habit into your life of thinking the life of self-sacrifice and of charity and of love. But you know, along the way I stumble. I fail all the time. And I need to be patient with other people who stumble and fail. And it's easy to say that just as a pithy little apophagum. But when I manifest that actively in the confessional, week after week after week, calling to mind my own faults, but then accepting God's forgiveness and putting them behind me, moving on, and then having grace or hoping for grace, praying and asking for grace to do likewise with my neighbor. It's this habit. It's an embodied practice that, that shows me and creates in me the kind of dispositions that really do begin to transform my own life, my faith, my home, my culture. 
In the imprint of Catholicism, this is another thing that impressed me as a convert, the imprint of Catholicism upon the world, in institutions, legal institutions, educational institutions, healthcare, science, all the rest of it, is the most humanizing, divinizing feature in human culture since the dawn of time. Yeah, the when, when I was a, a Lutheran Calvinist, faith alone, that, yeah, you don't want to go completely to the Gnostic side where it's just something I decided up here. It's got to make a difference in my life. But the idea of baptism, the sacraments, the things of the church, we didn't see as necessary. Right. They were They're a part extras. of it. They're extras. Extras. And all different denominations have different extras. <clears throat> What's important was faith alone. Yes. We don't want to go so far to say it's only that Gnostic side. But from a Catholic perspective, we recognize that God in his wisdom, maybe humor, but mystery, has not only said they're extras, but that they're necessary. Now talk about the necessity from a Catholic perspective of the physicality of the sacraments, the necessity of baptism, the necessity of the sacraments. Sure, sure. So, so they're necessary in multiple ways. One of them is that if we do not have, if we do not have rites and symbols, then we have no coherent way to live a, a corporate life together as members of one body. And Catholicism is meant to transform not only my individual relationship with God, but my relationship with my neighbor and my entire culture. And so the sacraments, as embodied expressions of living doctrines, are, are points of reference around which this disparate body of believers can gather. I mean, you've got to have yeah. a physical point of reference. Yeah. You know, I mean, people say, well, I don't like the church because they, they have holy days of obligation. They require you to come on this day. And my response is, well, you got to come on Sunday. <laughs> you know, if the church doesn't say you have to come on Sunday, we'll never all get together at one time. And, you know, one of the things that I love about the Catholic Church in its, in its physical embodied reality is that, you know, we don't split up just because we disagree. And when you go to Mass, you'll be there with people of a different political persuasion, people who even have different those allowable differences of theology, and yes, Catholics do have some allowable differences in theology, right. you know, personalities, temperaments. I'm from Alabama, so you could get Auburn fans and Alabama fans in the same church on the same Sunday, you know. <laughs> but we're united around Christ and the sacraments. That's a tremendous gift. St. Thomas also says the sacraments, it's fitting that they should be physical because it's in our physical embodiment that we sin. It's fitting that the, that the source, the instrument of our redemption, be pre, should be presented to us in the very same medium, if you will, that we offend God. So that the tools of our, of our falling away could also become renovated for us and become the tools of our renovation. And then finally, there's the doctrine of the dignity of our bodies. You know, the Catholic Church doesn't believe in the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. We believe in the doctrine of the resurrection from the dead, as Christ rose from the dead. We look forward to an embodied existence. That takes very seriously the dignity of our body. It's why, for a long time, the church, the church didn't allow cremation as a form of disposal mm -hmm. of the dead. Now, if you do cremate, it has to be done in very strict ways that mm -hmm. regard the dignity of the body and look forward to the resurrection of those remains on the last day. I'd like to pose something else for you to talk about. Another distinction from past to our understanding present as a Catholic, as evangelical Presbyterians, the, the emphasis was on the individual conversion, the individual salvation. Whereas a Catholic, we were, it's this movement of recognizing that we're saved as a part of a group. It's not so much the individual salvation mm -hmm. as a part of the mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. Radically different than when we come. Was that true for you, that, that transitional understanding difference between the individualism of salvation versus saved as a part oh, of the sure. body. Oh, sure. I remember I read uh, a book by Henri de Lubac, the Catholic theologian, Christ and the Common Destiny of Man, yeah. which Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, also said had a profound impact on him. Exactly. And the whole thesis of the book is yeah. this 
this v- very distinctly corporate element in, in Christian identity, yeah. and which I think is the correct way of reading St. Paul on the doctrine of justification, you know, that we're, we're formed as this one body in Christ through this common faith that we have, and we share with the members in, in, really in the, the dispensation of God's grace. And when we believe that and live it out, it has, a, it has a tremendously transformative impact on our social relations, and we see the fruit of it down through history. Oh. Um, so it's tremendously important. Now, there's, Catholics also must have a personal, individual relationship with God. They have to cultivate friendship with Christ in their heart. They must do that. Uh, but in doing that, they're joined to that one body of Christ and, and all the Catholics throughout the world that share that one faith, that one relationship. It's a good Jesus. example of extremes. You know, the, the, the extreme we came from was individual. It doesn't matter what church you go to as long as you got Jesus. That's that extreme. The group isn't as important. The Catholic extreme is it just, it, we forget that it is individual also. It's not just the group, that we really do have to have that individual relationship with Christ. We need to help our separate brethren because that being a part of the body is very important. I think about the Mass. Well, we say, not my sins, but the faith of the Church. The act of faith is an individual act. I believe. I believe. Yeah. You know, you have to. It is. But it is the faith of the Church that I confess. I believe what this society, this body of Christ, that he founded, teaches. Our guest is Dr. David Anders. You've been in the Church 15 years. We talked about your conversion into the church. Talk now about a Catholic 15 years later. What have you learned? What, why are you still Catholic, some might say, Sure. at this time in which well, we are doing this program? Uh, a lot of the answer to that question is in my new book, The Catholic Church Saved My Marriage. When I became Catholic, my wife was not happy about it. She was not Catholic, and she was not <laughs> happy about it. And, but we had had some pretty difficult times up till then. Life hadn't turned out the way other one of us thought it would, and... We were kind of tending in different directions, and it was very hard. It was very, very hard. And my conversion didn't help the matter initially. <laughs> Eventually, she came along and followed me through the uh, very good pastoral care given to her by a Franciscan Capuchin priest named Angela Shaughnessy. Hmm. And uh, we had our marriage convalidated in the church. And once we did, miracles really began to happen. Quite seriously, and now I live a life of marital bliss. I, I say that perfectly honestly, and I believe that. <laughs> and I think it's because of the grace of the sacraments and of the church in my life, and the teaching of the church, reforming the way I think about my marriage, my family, my vocation in life, what it means to live a moral and good life. All mm. these things have been affected and changed by becoming Catholic in ways that have made me a fundamentally better person. I got a long way to go, Marcus. I mean, I got a long way to go. But the before and after, I mean, it's, it's a huge difference. My wife, too. Years later, I asked Jill. Uh, Father Angelus had spoken to her in the confessional. She had been raised Catholic, so she could still go to confession. She went to confession to him. And I said, what did he say to you in the confessional that brought you along? She said, he told me something no one had ever told me before. He told me that my suffering had meaning. He told me that my suffering had meaning. Mm-hmm. And that's a part of the faith that you and I haven't yeah. talked about. You know, the right. way of redemption. Yeah. What is, how are we saved? We're saved, the Catholic Church teaches, by imitating Christ, but not in a moralistic way. Not like looking at a famous person and seeing his virtues and saying, I want to be like that when I grow up. But really, by seeking to live Christ's divine life after him. He died on the cross and rose again. I die with him in baptism and rise again with him. He sacrificed himself for his church. I sacrificed myself for my spouse. Reliving these divine mysteries of Jesus' life in the sacraments, trusting that the Holy Spirit will make them fruitful in my life and really will rebuild in me what I lost in Adam, namely to be in the likeness and image of God holding on to his mercy, believing that it's only by grace alone, and grace alone is a Catholic doctrine, though I cooperate with grace. And in that way, I can be saved. But part of that imitation of Christ, Jesus himself tells us, is you must take up your cross and follow me. One of the scriptures that I'm pretty sure you and I would have agreed with was central to our faith as Calvinists was Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. And that verse 
I mean, that's even one of the foundational verses to the once saved, always saved. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. But we ignored the fact that just 17 verses later, Paul says, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer. Provided we suffer with him, that's him. right. Provided now, we suffer. Romans 8, I believe, has to be read against Romans chapter 2. There's a Greek phrase in both of those texts where Paul speaks about the dikaiomata, or the dikaioma, two different words, singular and plural, of the law, the righteous requirements of the law, the justices of the law. And what he says is, look, works of the law, circumcision, Sabbaths, new moons, the laws of cash root, these things don't make you righteous. But if the Spirit of God causes your heart to be reborn in grace, and the love of God is shed abroad in your heart, at the end of the day, that's what the law pointed to, this renovation of the interior life and charity. To one who walks in the Spirit of God after this manner, one really does keep the inner demands of the law, the righteousness of the law is fully met, Paul says in Romans 8, 3, and 4. The righteousness of the law is fully met if you walk in the Spirit. But it's, it's that conditional the gift of the Spirit gives us the ability to love and be loved and not to be the slaves of our sin, our concupiscence, and our pride. But we must cooperate with grace. We must suffer with Him. And we cannot, he says in Galatians 5 and Romans 8, we can't turn back to those worthless deeds of darkness. St. Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3 says, if we do, better not to have entered the way of righteousness than to have started out on the path and then given up the virtues and head back. Yeah. In Philippians, Paul says, hey, I'm not perfect yet, guys, right? But forgetting what lies behind, I press onward. Right. I mean, that's the humility of the continual Catholic walk with Christ. Is uh, We're becoming perfected, but we almost learn more and more first how unperfected we are in the process. You know, Marcus, you, people sometimes ask me, how can you be a member of a church that has so many problems? And that's true. We do have problems as a Catholic. And I say, well, yeah, I guess I, I could look for a perfect church. I'd have to I'd have to leave it as soon as I got there because I'd bring my own imperfections to it. You know, I'd be the one the one black <laughs> sheep in the family. You know, I'm imperfect. The miracle of the Catholic faith is through these broken instruments. God gives to me on a daily basis this tremendous stock of teaching that frames my understanding of good, evil, right, wrong, the moral life, spirituality, prayer, and Christ. He gives me Christ. Yeah. And then he makes those teachings truly present to me in the sacramental mysteries. And all I can tell you is I'm not a saint yet, but I am, I'm a lot less of a sinner than I once was. You know, I'm moving in the right direction. I know the grosser vices that I've abandoned. I, I, I know the difference that it's made to my marriage and my friendships. And I see the difference that it makes in the people around me all the time. The Catholic faith is an enormous gift to me. And I cannot conceive of taking one foot out of the bed in the morning without putting on the full armor of God that Christ gives me in this tremendous, tremendous faith that he has given us in his church. Um, Ephesians 2, which is a verse you and I would have would have emphasized, uh, uh, by grace we are saved by faith, not by works, lest we boast. But it does talk about, yet we are created to do those works, those works which he called us to do. Given where you and I have come from, talk about the, the absolute essentialness of good works. Oh, sure. Well, Jesus talks about them over and over again. He talks about them over and over again. He says, if you pray in public to be seen by men, that's it. You get your reward in full. If you give alms in public to be seen by men, that's it. You got the whole, the whole thing. If you give alms, same thing. But if you do these things in secret, pray, fast, give alms, 
Your Father who sees in secret will reward you. He will reward you. This is God's condescension to us. Mm -hmm. That aided by grace, He really does create within us those works that He then rewards. St. Augustine says, God, you crown your own gifts in us. Right? Mm -hmm. It's beautiful because then the life that I live does have meaning. The question of what about this mortal life? Of what meaning or value is it? St. Thomas Aquinas says that any good deed done in the state of grace merits an eternal reward by God's condescension. Yeah. That's the way it works in divine economy. So even, you know, you help your child with her homework for the sake of the love of God, and you can merit your salvation by grace. You love your wife. You, you express repentance and extend re forgiveness. You reconcile enemies. You know, you hunger and thirst for righteousness. God will reward these things in your life. And if we're following Christ, then we will be living this kind of way. Now, we have to temper that with St. Dismas, thief on the cross. Now, he did a lot of good work, St. Dismas. He confessed Christ. He made yeah. an act of humility. He made an act of faith. He had courage. But he, he didn't have an opportunity to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give drink to the thirsty, because he's, you know, nailed up yeah. on a cross. But he said, Lord Jesus, have mercy upon me when you come into your kingdom. And he's the first canonized saint in the Catholic Church. Yeah. Well, part of the journey, I think, of understanding good works is, I mean, I can give you something, uh, David, with the idea that if I give this to you, then, you, then you're obligated to me. Or I'm giving it because I'm going to expect something from you in the future. Um, you know, like that old, from the Godfather, you know, I'm gonna, you're going to owe me something, mm -hmm. all right? But the kind of good works that our Lord expects of us is giving and letting go. You know, giving, secretly giving to some, doing it not because I'm obligating God to give me salvation, but because I freely give that for His sake, for His glory, for His honor. And to me, that's a really important part. The, the sheep and the goats parable, I didn't know what I did with that as a Calvinist. Mm, yeah. But really, it is about, as you talked about, it's, it's the alms, it's the caring, it's the praying, the fasting in secret. That's what that's about. You know, uh, I was reading an article once by the Dominican theologian Thomas Joseph White, who uh, was talking about the Lutheran doctrine of justification. And he clarified a point for me. He framed it so concisely hmm. that in Lutheranism, in Luther's theology, a man can be justified, can be reconciled to God while he remains at enmity with God in his will. Hmm. And that's true. That's the, yeah. that's the Lutheran doctrine. And I appreciated Father White really putting it that way. From the Catholic point of view, the idea that I can be in loving union with you and hate you at the same time is incoherent. Hmm. Salvation means, salvation means that I have friendship with God. The idea that I can have friendship with God and yet hate God makes no sense at all yeah. because love is a desire to be in union. Now, if I love God truly, I'm going to love His image wherever I find it. And so I'm going to love my neighbor if I really love God, I'm going to love my neighbor because God's image is imprinted on my neighbor. And I'm even going to love all created being in a proportionate way. I'm going to love the world that God created because it's good. Talk about, in, in the final moments then, the distinction between we're in the past, kind of a once saved, always saved, you've arrived, but no aspect of continuing conversion, continuing growing in grace, whereas from a Catholic, that's absolutely essential. Sure. The Catholic tradition teaches that the spiritual life is actually a, a long progress. We have a pretty pronounced doctrine of, you know, developed spirituality, three ages of the interior life, purge myself of sin, begin to enter into a mystical relationship with God, look forward to an ultimate union with Him in my heart, which is the patrimony of the saints. And uh, there's enough work to do to keep you busy the rest of your life. I mean, there really is. And, uh, and it's, it's tremendous. It's tremendous. And we didn't even touch on Catholic spirituality and the depths yeah. of prayer. Yeah. So much to I'm do. I'm assuming that this book, um, The Catholic Church Saved My Marriage, is not just about how your wife changed. Oh, no. It's mostly about how I discovered the Catholic faith and how it radically no, changed it's the It's how you... Oh, she, I'm the bad guy in this book. I'm the bad <laughs> guy in I this bet. book. Yeah.
Yeah, it's about how we changed and how by grace we discover. Even the, the John Paul's and spirituality, I mean, um, John of the Cross's Dark Night of the Soul is how we, we grow in spirituality, but then we, we realize we need more. God knows we need more. Pulls sure. away from us so that we pull more towards him. Boy, David. I, hey, Marcus, thank it, you so it, much. It goes too fast. Thank you, absolutely. It's good to have you on the program. It's good Again, to be I'm going to remind the audience that David ha is a host of EWTN's Called to Communion, uh, author of of the Catholic Church Saved My Marriage, and uh, I, I encourage you to go and look at the other things that David does on EWTN, and also remind you that his full conversion story is available on the Coming Home Network website. So if you'd like to read his full story as well as others, go to chnetwork.org. God bless you. I hope that David's story was an encouragement to you. See you next week.